Thank you for joining us on The Media Connection. Today, we're at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church here on the south side of Chicago for a press conference in which community leaders are urging city, state, and federal elected officials to equip more hospitals with trauma centers. Gun violence is at an epidemic in Chicago, but more deaths could be prevented. Reverend Jesse Jackson, along with ministers, aldermen, and state representatives are expressing the importance of having trauma centers near the areas where the trauma and the violence occurs. There are three cities there. There's West and South Side, the heavy fact that they support race. There's North Side, and there is the suburbs. The kid was shot in front of our office last Friday night. So I saw him lay there bleeding. They rushed him to the emergency wagon to work on him about but we did not take him to get rid of Chicago for trauma care, which is called the golden hour, the first hour when lives are lost or saved. And they take him to Stroger through traffic. And that was about according to the Sun Time about thirty two thousand blacks die a year, lack of access to medical treatment. And so we have someone with work with Dr. Rick Klein others on the issue of we need a trauma unit. Trauma on the near north side, we have the least trauma, we have the most trauma units. Here we have the most trauma, we have the least trauma. We need help. So we're calling for a plan, a comprehensive plan for construction. I want for the client to address quickly the issue of trauma, beyond this issue of, uh, of, the, of the role of the hood to play in reconstruction of public housing. Studies have shown that those first few minutes after a person has been seriously injured are critical to saving that person's life. If it takes too long to get the person to the hospital, how can we save lives? The drive time between the scene of the crime or the accident or the physical trauma and the time it takes to get the person to necessary treatment could mean the difference between life and death. So why can't we simply decide to put trauma centers in the hospitals where so much high crime is occurring? Gunshot wounds take special treatment and special skills. When it takes too long to get a person to the necessary facilities, they lose a lot of blood. This is the issue that community activists are asking elected officials to consider and simply to decide to put the funding where it needs to go to save lives. Let's hear some more from those who are urging our government elected officials to put trauma centers where they need to go. In all the city of Chicago, that's the farthest distance from the nearest health facility that treats gunshot victims. This, the dot is in pretty much the exact same place, so it makes absolutely no sense. Um, the need for a trauma center on the south side of Chicago uh, is, is, is very real, and it, and it is a crisis. We are losing lives. Uh, studies have shown, several studies, that ambulance drives times. As Re Reverend Jackson said, the first hour of care is the most important <clears throat> and studies have shown that ambulance drive times are costing people's lives on the south side. So the way it works is that there's a, a trauma center at Stroger, as Reverend Jackson mentioned, there's a trauma center at Northwestern, and there's a trauma center at Advocate Christ. So you've got these three trauma centers, and guess where the gun violence is at? Right here. So the distance from the nearest trauma center is, is, is as far as it can be in all of Chicago. You cannot talk about a trauma center on the south side of Chicago without talking about the University of Chicago Medical Center. Why? Because everyone in this room knows that that's the medical center that has by far the most resource of any medical center on the south side. Uh, they have to be not just a, a willing member of the conversation, but an active and aggressive member of a regional solution to get a trauma center on the south side. When we first started working on this a couple years ago, people were not aware of the issue. Uh, there were people who said it wasn't an important issue. At this point, 
because of the awareness has grown, there is a, a, a consensus and a, a growing urgency on the South Side to, uh, to make this happen. And it's groups exactly like this um, that can apply the pressure to institutions like the University of Chicago. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is celebrating its 50th year in existence and since President Lyndon Johnson signed the bill that created this department, there has been a lot of urban blight. What will it take to give power to HUD, Housing and Urban Development, in order to develop what we need in our urban communities? Dr. Reverend Leon Finney is a well-known figure in Chicago not just because of his church activities, but because of his activities as a developer. Building new houses, building new businesses, these are things that create the jobs. So how can we begin to develop these areas where there are boarded up buildings and vacant lots and places that cause crime to fester? I think that Reverend Jackson has eloquently addressed the whole issue of what we can do with the Justice Department and the police to arrest the issue of guns coming into this city. However, that alone will not solve the problem. We are at this moment on the brink of celebrating the 15th year when President Lyndon Baines Johnson, August 10th, signed into law a legislation that created the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is that department that has the comprehensive mandate across these United States to actively engage in urban community development in urban areas like the city of Chicago. August the 10th, he signed it into law. It was just preceded by, obviously, the 1965 voting rights uh, legislation. But the important thing is that HUD has the ability and the mandate to address this problem of urban decay and urban disintegration, dis 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 disintegration in the city of Chicago. We have to challenge the United States Department of HUD to live up to its mandate and provide the capital, the investment money, necessary to rebuild the neighborhoods. As we rebuild the neighborhoods, jobs will be available, business will come back alive. So the critical question is, can we have the national resolve here at this moment in the city of Chicago to make it happen. We have two senators, one Mark Kirk and the other uh, Richard Durbin or Dick Durbin. They have to step up to the plate and make absolutely sure that there's sufficient money to make our neighborhoods come back alive and become safe. I can say this in closing, that there's no solution that we can create just by speaking out. We have to engage every element of our community. And one of them critical at this particular point is the United States Department of Housing and Development. It can guarantee mortgages, and it can make sure that banks have the support in order to loan a person money in order to renovate a foreclosed house. They can do all kinds of things. That's why the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development was created. It's not supposed to be just a, a, a shadow of FHA. It's supposed to do everything it can in order to help rebuild urban America. Second Ward Alderman Bob Fioretti makes a very significant point that we need to have an urban agenda. We need a plan looking not just in Chicago but across America and seeing that violence occurs when there is unemployment, decay, joblessness, and hopelessness. Why can't those who have been elected to public office simply create a plan for urban renewal? It makes sense. So, who do we need to talk to to make this happen? Clearly, we have a crisis here in our city right now. And this weekend we just exemplified it. And we can do better. We have the resources when we want to have resources to build parks, to build a uh, privately financed, uh, for private use, a stadium, a McCormick place. We have ways to do that. We can put our, our children to work. We've got, uh, we've had programs in TIF. We have the money if we want it. We need the political resolve. When we deal with 80,000 vacant homes and lots, 
or we can put people as uh, under an urban, aggressive urban agenda to train people, to put people into how we clean up our houses, how we clean up our neighborhoods, and then we have a new house. We have 18,000 homeless kids in our Chicago public school system. That alone, ought to, we ought to be able to find ways to house them and create houses for them. We have enough in the areas that are under perpetual attack, where our people, where our folks and our people are all suffering almost from a, you know, uh, some kind of trauma, uh, mentally. When our children see their schools closed, and then a week later the house across from them is, is boarded up, they know something's wrong. We can't let them lose hope. We need to restore hope. We need to create an aggressive urban agenda with everyone here and what we talk about and move forward for the city of Chicago. State Representative Mary Flowers is a powerhouse down in Springfield. She creates legislation that makes sense. The question is, will her colleagues join her in creating the kind of climate in Chicago that can generate revenue? We need trauma centers, but we also need the financial structures that will generate the kind of revenue that creates jobs. What do we need to do to make that happen? Perhaps we need to take a look at the banking system. We need to take a look at so many financial institutions in our communities. Are citizens really being helped? And what do we need to change in order to change this environment of hopelessness? Mary Flowers has certainly done her part. Now we need to urge other elected officials to also have a vision of how we're going to change the conditions in our urban communities. As Reverend stated, I have legislation and have had it for a couple years now in regards to financial transaction tax being one because there are some business people that because they have a faster computer, they get to bid on certain commodities much faster and cause every, everybody else to pay higher. That's number one. Number two, uh, North Dakota has had its own bank since 1909. And they don't have the problems that we have here in the state of Illinois. Other communities, other cities, or other states are talking about having their own bank as well. But Illinois, we should have our own bank. If we had our own bank, we would not have to be depending on the, the rules of the federal banks in regards to what we can and cannot do. We could fix up our own homes. We could expand our own uh, communities as far as jobs and education is concerned. Also, if we had a single-payer health care, that would mean that all hospitals would have to comply to a certain, certain rules, to the same amount of rules. But more importantly, if I may say this, this is not Afghanistan, this is Chicago, the city of Chicago. And if this was Afghanistan, they would be talking about, once that war was over with, whenever it's going to be over with, they would be talking about rebuilding. We have been in a war since the very beginning. In 1965, when we had the uh, AIDS family with dependent children, the rule was that the fathers had to leave the home in order for the mothers to get the money. That was the law. And the, and the women couldn't get jobs, and we couldn't get educated. And so when you think about the years that families have been fragmented in regards to being on aid where the fathers couldn't be there, the fathers had to leave, the mothers couldn't work, and then when parents tried to get jobs, the jobs were low-wage jobs, then the factories closed. And as Reverend stated, the schools closed, and the jobs left that was around the schools. So when you look at what has been happening in our community, we haven't even discussed mental illness in our community. And you're right, Reverend, our, our community is, it is in shock. If this was any other type of community, help would be put in to try to address the problems of these children. They're not being able to get their medication, and people haven't even diagnosed, diagnosed them as being sick. But there is a problem here, and it needs to be addressed, and not fragmentedly. We need to talk about reparation, and part of the... Usually the students that's educated in college, they're not out here shooting. They're not angry. There's something inherently wrong in our community that's not being addressed. You cannot continue to walk on by us as if we don't exist. We are living in a war zone. The elderly people, just 10 years ago, 
It was headlines that elderly people found dead in their homes because they were afraid to open their windows. They could not afford air conditioning. The kids couldn't go to the park. So what if you expand the parks and fix them up? The kids are afraid to go. Parks do not create jobs. Playing basketball do not create jobs or provide opportunities for families. We are talking about men and women that want to protect their children. And in order to do that, we must have a home. In order to do that, we must have a job. In order to do that, we must be educated. Our lives is not to be played with. We are not statistics. All of us have kids and grandkids and family members that we love. I'm calling on the governor. I'm calling on the mayor of the city of Chicago to come and meet. And let's talk about what we could do. We live in this community. Ask us what we need in our community. Don't tell us. We do not need the state police. We do not need the National Guards. They will not bring jobs. They will not bring money. They will not create education. They will not create opportunity. That's what we need in our community. The same thing that other communities have. Right a few doors down, a few blocks away from me is Beverly. They do not have the problems that we're having in our community. Downtown city of Chicago, I remember when downtown city of Chicago, parts of it looked like it was a dump. Look at it now. Changes can be made if you respect the community, if you respect the people. We want to be respected. Thank you.
except that the mayor has a role to play in this. And his plan has not worked because, because he's been overpowered by the, the, the gun drug flow. And they're not coming from Chicago. They, 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 we're not giving good gun and drug manufacturing in Chicago. Our jobs in, I mean drugs in, guns in, jobs. I, I'm really appealing to you uh, as partners in this process, looking at that. And now we need an urban policy. Every day I pick up the paper here, where's the president's foreign policy? Where's the domestic policy? Right. It's, it's, it's Chicago and it's East St. Louis. And it's Memphis. And it's Newark. I, I, we, need, we, we need a domestic urban policy. We need a domestic urban bank, a reconstruction bank. The, the, the zones that banks will not touch, there must be a, a, a structure. That's why LBJ was meaningful because of Office of Economic Opportunity. A revived war on poverty. Uh, you cannot explain away uh, these number of basement houses, these number of closed schools and houses and see nothing but danger on, on, and people are traumatized. This man is here because his right. child, he has his child with him. He is afraid his child might get killed. Right. This, is, this is real stuff. Yeah. A woman is on the highway right now. Yeah. It's 63rd and, uh, yeah. and, and, and the dam right now, blown brain blood this morning, father, right now. That must be a sense of urgency and we must all be involved in that process. But those who have the power have the responsibility. Well, but what happens is when you destroy 80,000 homes through chicanery and bank exploitation, houses destroyed, jobs lost. The best homeowner stands at his home and shot on the doorstep because of the drug, drug, he can't stop the drug flow. Los Angeles did not ask for a handout when this housing project was falling apart. What they did, someone came in and invested into the community because they respected the community and they created jobs. So you don't hear about Los Angeles anymore. The same principle with New York. There's more people in Los Angeles, more people in New York, and they don't have the problems that we have. What we have in our communities, we have families, parents that are traumatized. Yes. They're afraid to talk. The media and the law is saying, hey, come and tell us what's going on. But who's going to keep us safe? Who's going to stop the violence? We have communities where I come, out of, I come up, I was raised up in Roseland, Inglewood, and North London. When I was in Roseland, my home got shot in two. So this is something that's very dear to me. And one of the things that I notice in our communities that's allowed to go on, not just the lack of opportunity and resources as it relates to economic growth, but also when we talk about safety and our children being able to just simply walk down the street. That's right. That's a problem. That's right. If my child can't walk down the street, then we look at, okay, who's responsible for that? If there's guns in the community to such an extent that our children can't walk down the street, then that's a safety issue. That's a safety issue. What do I mean by that? When my son and I, in all of these communities where the violence is on the rise, and I'm, I'm saddened by it because it's a part of me. It's not my child. It could have been my child. That's right. But it's not my child. But my question to the, to the politicians is this, and to the police department, and to the mayor is this. If it was your own community, what would you do? Would you, would you provide the resources? Would you shut down and deal with the safety issue? Would you allow a weekend to go in your community, and I'm talking ethnicity now, and allow 82 deaths, I mean 82 shootings, Seven. 14, 15 homicides? Where's the sensitivity in the hearts of the politicians to really make a difference in this area? Because at the end of the day, safety, is the issue for my child. That's right. And, and then when you got a parent that's saying at all costs, I'm going to keep my child safe. Right. Because that's what's happening now. That's what's happening. If you can't keep them safe, I'm going to keep my son safe. I'm keep him safe. So I'm asking the politicians, and I'm asking the mayor, and I'm asking the police, when we talk about going into the community, just to me for just one more minute. We drive through the community, we come after the fact. We have communities where the police department are very aware that are drug houses, come What's on, happening? that are drug houses, 
gang infested community. Who doing the and shooting? it's allowed to happen. Who doing the shooting? People got to, you know, people are trying to get resources because the economic, the economic opportunity is not there. But at the end of the day, there's still a responsibility to, to the community, to the families within the community. Because everybody in the community is not selling dope. Everybody in the community, there's hard working people in these communities. Thank you for joining us on this edition of The Media Connection. We urge you to get involved. Do you know who your alderman is? Do you know who your state representative is? Do you know who your congressman is? Do you know who your senator is? These are the people whose salaries we pay. That means they need to work for our benefit. These things that our community leaders and activists are asking are doable. It's a matter of making a decision. Do we as a community, as a city, as a nation care enough about the lives of people to equip the hospitals where they live with trauma centers? Do we really want to make life better for those who are suffering? It's a decision. So we urge you to get involved. Call your elected officials. Ask them where they stand on these issues. We need an urban agenda and we need to collectively work to make it happen. I'm your host, Naima Latif. We'll see you again next time on The Media Connection.